Imagine a world where we actually listen to black women. When we do, we can see how the technological ecosystems built by black feminists over centuries of creatively surviving overwhelming oppression can give rise to new digital spaces that counter the toxic patriarchal hegemony. A new book from Dr. Catherine Knight Steele lays out the arguments in favor of centering digital black feminism with regard to technology. Welcome to Augmented Humanity. Our guests are modern explorers working at the intersection of technology and the humanities. They help us to understand ourselves and the worlds we create in this digital age. They are thinkers, creators, makers, and academics working in diverse fields like linguistics, technology, game and object design, and ethics. I'm your host, Craig Goldsmith. I'm your host, Ellen Dornan. We're joined today by Dr. Catherine Knight Steele, an assistant professor of communication at the University of Maryland College Park. Dr. Steele was the founding director of the African American Digital Humanities Initiative and currently directs the Black Communication and Technology Lab as part of the Digital Inquiry, Speculation, Collaboration, and Optimism Network. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's absolutely great to be here. I am so curious about your work, both your current position and the program that you founded at the University of Maryland. So I'll give you a little teaser about each one of those. I came to Maryland about six years ago to direct the African American Digital Humanities Initiative, which was a Mellon funded grant. And it was the first of its kind program in the US that merged the areas of African American history and culture with digital humanities. And the goal of that project was really to start a network of scholars and scholarship at that intersection and to provide real grounded support for students, for faculty, and also community members who were already doing things like creating their own digital archives. So that was a fantastic three years of working with students and faculty, some of whom had never touched digital things before, some of whom had only touched digital things before, but had not thought about the ways that Black theory and thought and Black studies could really change the kinds of questions they were asking and really open them up to new possibilities in their work. And after finishing my tour of duty with Adhume, we had a big national conference, the first conference in Black Digital Humanities in the U.S. I then was really excited to begin work with the DISCO Network. You have to love that acronym, <laughs> right? <laughs> so this is a fairly new network that's founded by Lisa Nakamura out of University of Michigan, who is really one of the architects of internet studies. And I get to run the BCAT lab or the Black Communication and Technology Lab and do some of the work that Adhim was doing, but also widen our scope a bit to include some social scientists and information scientists who also might be curious about those intersections. And what I'm trying to do now is build a pipeline that people can take at other universities that really brings students all the way from high school to the professoriate in thinking about race and technology and specifically thinking about Black history and culture as a part of that. The most exciting thing about the Disco Network to me is the O, which is the optimism part. Very often we think about race and technology in very dismal ways. And we think about oppression and we think about racism. And these are really important topics. But our network is really committed to the optimism part of seeing how human beings do amazing things in the hardest of circumstances. So when you say that you want a pipeline of people that are from high school to the professorial, what's the end result there? Is this people that are going to go out and do startups or is this people that are going to teach or do research? All of the above, yeah. <laughs> Also, we noticed that there are folks who are missing in all of these spaces. And just to name it, our university, University of Maryland, is in College Park. It's in Prince George's County, which is a predominantly Black county. But our school is very low number of Black students that come in at the undergraduate level and even lower number that come in and stay through in our field. And what we want to show folks is that there are possibilities in the humanities to do really interesting, important work with technology, that it's not simply STEM fields. It's not just computer science. And those are great fields, but those aren't the only options for for our students. And so we want students who are interested in things like justice and activism, but also potentially interested in going to corporate spaces and doing ethical work uh, in Twitter, right? And working on big name apps to get their start by really thinking about how these things impact themselves and their communities. And what better place than the humanities to learn those things? One of the things, and I think it's in the introduction to your book that 
even if we get all these young black women coding, so what? They're going to go and be immersed in some sort of toxic culture that's not taking these things into account. I think what ties hopefully some of the work that I'm trying to do with the BCAT lab and Adhume to the book is we think about coding and technology in really specific ways. And we think of these as technical skills that certain groups lack, and therefore we need to teach to them in order to make them a part of our economic superstructure, right? And I wondered at the start of this book, well, what happens if we actually think about the expertise that individuals and communities already have as a result of their long trajectory in this country? What technical expertise is being overlooked as we demand specifically that Black students learn more coding or learn more about how to get jobs in the tech field. We're actually acting as though there is a dearth of knowledge on the part of Black individuals in this area, and evidence just doesn't bear that out. So I hope that while we do encourage people to pursue all of the goals that you know might be of interest to them, we open the door to thinking about the fact that there are other forms of technical and technological expertise that we have really ignored for a long time. So in a sense, are you talking about almost a bias that exists in terms of what we think of as a technically sophisticated skill? Absolutely. It's a long-term built-in, baked-in bias that I think all of us have. It's been really well done, I think is the point <laughs> of erasing our knowledge. And by our, I mean the knowledge of women, the knowledge of people of color who have had technical skills in a variety of areas until that was no longer considered technical, until it became domestic work, until it became pink collar work, low-skilled labor, right? Minimum wage jobs. And we call them these things in order to diminish the impact and the amount of expertise expertise necessary to master these skill sets. And this happened at really specific moments in our history, and I would argue for really specific reasons, in order to have technology fall to certain individuals who could find profit from it. So we watched this happen during chattel slavery. We watched this happen as women are moved out of positions of experts and knowledge makers within the home, right? These are intentional things. It wasn't an accident that we've landed in a place where we no longer believe that certain individuals have capacities to be technological ingenues. You said pink collar. I actually have not heard that term before. So pink collar jobs are jobs that women tend to have in higher numbers than men in our economy. So things like nursing skills, teaching, for example, gets labeled as a pink collar job. And when these pink collar jobs get labeled as such, we diminish the skill sets that are associated with them, right? So teaching becomes something anyone can do. But when we have programs that suggest, well, anyone can teach in an inner city, I think a lot of research shows the reason that that happens is because women tend to fill those professions. You said that there is this sort of bias against skill sets that in the modern era would not be considered, quote, technical, end quote. So can you give some just examples of what would be skill sets that you consider to be highly technical or require like a lot of mastery? In the book, I talk a bit about this in the intro about agricultural labor and agricultural knowledge and expertise. So there is a running kind of thought that the reason that folks were enslaved was because we needed low skilled workers to do this work. But the opposite of that is true. Folks who were going to the continent of Africa and kidnapping people were kidnapping folks who had really high skill sets that were required in order to make an economy function. They were kidnapping human beings who had mastered things like growing rice that folks here didn't know how to do. They simply couldn't make it work. So they needed people who knew how to do this work, who knew how to do it effectively and efficiently and were already very capable at it. And so if it were the case that enslaved black people had no skills or low skills, they would not have been enslaved for the periods of time that they were. They would not have been the blacksmiths. They would not have been the folks who were cultivating the crops. They would not be the folks who were responsible for creating cotton gins and creating ironing boards and creating the domestic kind of tools that were necessary for households and plantations to function. So we've done this kind of weird mental trickery to ourselves where we've told ourselves that the reason that people were in these positions is because they didn't have skill sets. Today, when I watch folks do that work, there's no way I could master that, right? It's, it's not possible. If it was so easy to grow a garden, everybody would have one. <laughs> I can kill any plant. 
Absolutely. That persists. And I think that we've also taken away the technological skill of oratory as well, right? And the way that people learned new language, created new language, created hidden discourses and languages, that's technical expertise, right? The ability to speak in front of someone and not have them have no idea what you're saying is so that you stay alive in that environment requires a really high skill set in terms of oratory. What do you mean by a hidden discourse? There's a lot of work that folks talk about in terms of the way that when enslaved persons from the continent of Africa were brought to the U.S., had to learn multiple languages, multiple ways of speaking and communicating, both with other enslaved individuals, but also with the folks who were the enslavers. And so they developed hidden discourses and languages where they could communicate things to each other openly that were not understood by the folks who, if they found out, could result in punishment, death, violence against their bodies. What I think is marvelous about studying Black feminist rhetoric is that what Black women were doing, were doing this twice over. They were simultaneously hiding discourses from the enslavers who were white at that time, but also from men. They were finding ways to be involved in multiple communities at once and survive in each one of those communities, to provide expertise without too much expertise so that it didn't result in even more labor this really interesting balance and dance and art and skill that often gets muddied over and ignored in our history books. All this study and all this research, is this coming out of your work with DISCO or is this part of a longer term body of research? DISCO is pretty new. We just formed in April. The folks that are involved in the DISCO network, these are folks who I was reading about in graduate school that I now get to work with. I'm living the dream. Ray Fouché and Andre Brock and Lisa Nakamura, who just were amazing innovators in thinking about digital technology, race, Blackness, Black vernacular technological creativity, which is a term from Ray Fouché, one that I really enjoy and love. I've been writing about online technology and Black discourse since 2008. 2007, 2008. And at that time, the landscape was very different. It was very hard to find anyone else doing that work. And those of us who were, were really just trying to say, we're here. That was the entry point that we had was simply to say, our literature right now suggests that Black people are not online and are deficient in their use of technology. That was the predominating idea in our field at that time. So there was a lot of the talk about, we need to get more computers into the inner city. We need to teach black people skill sets. We still hear a lot of that, right? But that was it. That was all that was there. And it was such a mismatch to what my lived experience was that I simply at the start of graduate school said, I just have to write down what we're doing because I don't know that everyone knows that there are vibrant black communities online doing really cool things. When you say that your personal experience was different, can you provide some examples? When I left undergrad, I was working in brand management and I was selling commercials for brand leaders. You know, I won't name their names. But while I was doing that, it was such a shock to my system because I was back in my hometown of Chicago, but my day-to-day -day life involved seeing almost no one that looked like me. And it was the first time in a long time that that had been the case. And instead, what I found myself doing in my cubicle was delving online into the world of the Black blogosphere, which was very rich and very vibrant in 2008 and 2009 and 2007. There were these communities of people who were having similar experiences to me and talked the way that I did, but also had the same kind of jobs that I did and the same kind of educational background that I did. And we were all just kind of at work on the blog, living this other life. And it was a place where people were talking about everything under the sun, from hair care to the presidential race at the time to what we watched on TV last night. But what I was realizing is what we were doing in those spaces was not so different than what we'd always done as Black folks, which is find places for discourse to talk about the things that matter to our everyday life while simultaneously building community and advancing public political agendas. So conversations about hair care turned into conversations about policy. Conversations about mothering turned into conversations about who we're voting for and how to mobilize for that candidate. And this is exactly what has always happened historically in Black churches, in Black barber shops, in beauty shops, on the corner, at the kitchen table, places that exist for Black folks outside of the gaze of the dominant group. And that's what was happening online that I was drawn to as just a person who needed that. And then, oh, I'm in grad school. I can write about this. <laughs> 
so following bloggers back in the misty past of 2008, <laughs> that, that actually led to your dissertation. It did. So my dissertation was called The Digital Barbershop, and I tracked Black blogs. And I intentionally didn't look at political blogs that were named political. I looked at blogs that were lifestyle blogs and humor blogs and mommy blogs and hair blogs and made the argument that these were the places where ideology was formed, where people changed their minds, where people became active citizens and advanced agendas that were important for their families and their communities, and that these places were intentionally hidden. They weren't counter public that were visible. They were what Catherine Squires calls enclaves and satellite publics. And I love her work on that because while counterpublics is a really useful term in a lot of ways, it doesn't describe the reasons and the ways that sometimes people gather outside of the view of others and why they have to do that. And historically why it's mattered to have those really private separate spaces to create new arguments that they can test out among each other before they're forced to use them in public. I think that the nomenclature of enclave is a really good one, and I would suggest that I think that applies to almost any marginalized community. Absolutely. And, you know, whether oh, it's yeah. ethnic or based on gender identification, and I think that's the way that people roll. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you so much for talking with us today. I did want to talk a little bit about your book, which is out in October, right? Yes. Digital Black Feminism. And I figured out partway through the book that it was Black Feminism in a Digital Space. I just went to a responsible tech conference last week. And I have been thinking, what would better digital spaces look like? What contributes to a better digital space? And you come up with a lot of principles and practices of Black feminism that are expressed in digital spaces in all kinds of ways. And so I was wondering if we could talk a little bit about some of those and about what it might mean for other digital spaces. I think that the biggest takeaway in doing the book and thinking for a lot of months and years about the topic um, is that what makes for a better digital space is what would make for a better space offline too. The same things that we're fighting in digital realms, the same kinds of oppressive forces that find their way into the Twitterverse, the same kinds of violence that Black women deal with online, they deal with offline. The same kinds of ways that we're separated, we are separated offline. And until we're really ready to tackle some of the issues that are weaving their way and have woven their way into the fabric of our society more broadly, we can't do it in a digital way, right? We can't make these fixes to pieces of our society in hopes that they will undo the problems that are really at the root and the core. And I think a lot of the technology fixes that we're looking for in terms of, well, maybe we can turn off the comment sections, or maybe we can have more moderation, or we can do these other things. We're really trying to put a Band-Aid on what's a big old bullet hole, right? <laughs> but I think what I try to do in the book is talk about how Black women have navigated these spaces in ways that have helped them survive and thrive in the face of seeming as though they shouldn't, right? So some of those principles that I outline are less directives from me and more observations from what women have done in particularly spaces like the blogosphere, which I think is really important that we still talk about because it was this really unique moment 
where Black women operated their own spaces online, where they were very much not reliant on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok to have control over what could be posted or how long it could be or what it could look like or who could participate. And that is really a moment where we get to see people have the space to come up with some interesting principles and some interesting praxis. So that's where I think we should turn our attention to is when did people have the opportunity to do all of that? <laughs> and what did they do when they did? You look at this as a case where it was successful. Yeah, I think success in so much as that's where it was built. I think that's what I would say. I think digital black feminism was built in the blogosphere and we've seen its outputs happen. Now we don't see the blogosphere as much, right? So everywhere else, we're kind of seeing these principles play out in other places. And I think there's some testing of them that's happening right now as to whether or not they hold up for folks who are interested in doing black feminist liberatory work. You talked about putting the Band-Aid on the bullet hole. Are you saying that what might be systemic or systemic violence towards Black women, you just basically see those same sort of behaviors play out online? Unfortunately, I think it's all part of the same kind of mess that we've created for ourselves as a country, right? I do believe in harm reduction, right? And I think it's important that we do as often as possible talk about the very real ways that institutions and companies and organizations and governments have responsibilities toward harm reduction. We can do a both and, right? Of that, right. like, you know, it yeah. doesn't mean we throw up our hands and say whatever happens online is just what's happening. We can't address any problem until we get to the core. We can do both. We can do the walking and the chewing, and we can make sure that these companies are accountable to the people who are making them billions of dollars. Because in many ways, Black women are making them billions of dollars by being tastemakers and trendsetters and influencers and early adopters of these technologies. And so if we are the ones that are making them the money, they have a responsibility. I hadn't even thought about that. And that's clear if you look at who the influencers are. Absolutely. You had talked about violence online. Some people would think it was reasonable to say, well, sticks and stones may break your bones and it's just online and you're just getting trolled. And it's not the same as someone throwing a rock through your front window, but you're suggesting it's violence. And so what does that look like? I am. And I think that there's a point in my life where I would have said something similar. And I think until one experiences the kind of persistent harassment and diminishment and doxing and all of these things that happen and the way that they're so targeted, everyone doesn't get that online. And I think it's really important to say that because I know that that argument happens often. It's like, well, you know, everybody's kind of mean to people online. Everybody has had to deal with, you know, somebody's gotten a bad comment on their post. Yeah, we've all gotten someone who said something offhandedly bad. Have we all gotten sustained weeks of harassment? You know, have we all gotten pictures of our loved ones posted without our consent and commentary about our family members? Have we all gotten violent threats of sexual assault in our private messages or sent to our employer? I don't think we've all gotten that. I'm clear that we haven't because I know that if everyone were getting it, we would see it as a bigger problem. But because the people who most often get that are women, and on top of that are women of color, we have not decided that it's as big of a problem as it actually is. From the Black women that I study, what a lot of them have decided to do is leave those spaces, spaces that at one time were not only vibrant communal spaces for cultural production, but were also financially viable spaces for them to make money. I think what we're finding is that in some ways, the blogosphere was this beautiful moment. The early Twitter days were these nice places. And we've reached a point now where some folks have decided this isn't working out anymore because the protections that we had in those spaces just don't exist anymore over here. And the allowance that we've made as a society for this vile behavior over time has encouraged it to amplify. And that kind of speaks to what you were saying, that it's no different than what's happening necessarily in meat space, which is if you don't feel comfortable going into the store or eating at the restaurant because someone's just going to be so ridiculously unpleasant, and now you've actually cut yourself off from what might have been a very important part of your personal and professional life. What I'll say is the added piece to that, though, is what if the restaurant needed mean people in order to survive? I want to go to the museum, but in order to go to the museum, I have to be subjected to harassment because the museum needs harassers. They require it for their platform survival. You talk about a few cases where creators were able to move from an enclave or from a space where they had a lot of control over who could respond or who was part of the conversation to bigger platforms or owned platforms. 
And it sounds like sometimes it works out and sometimes people sort of split their effort across platforms instead of just being present in one space where they can be a little bit more personal in spaces that feel slightly safer. It's interesting to me how you describe the losses and wins. Yeah, definitely. So I'll just give a couple examples, right? So we had folks who started in the blogosphere, really small blogs, their friends from college reading them that grew into these couple thousand people a day reading. It's pretty big, you know, at the time and grew to a point where they started to get some media attention, some book deals, people recognizing the talent and the skill that was necessary to cultivate those spaces. Some of my favorite writers started out that way and have now been New York Times bestselling authors and you know have their own platforms. But you're absolutely right, there is a give and take to it. And it's an individual decision as to what is most useful at that moment for the individual. And I think that that's part of what digital black feminism allows for in really interesting ways that pushes a little bit off from the original conceptions of black feminist thought of the 60s and 70s, that you have digital black feminists who are making decisions that are very much about their own agency and their own financial success unapologetically, that they are suggesting that while my community really matters and my ability to make a difference there, I don't have to sacrifice my own personal success in order to do that. I don't have to say no to everything. I don't have to keep everything hidden in order to do that. I demand the space to take up space in these other realms where you suggest I shouldn't be. And it's a fascinating thing to watch happen because I think there is some tension between other feminist thinkers who are saying, watch out for what happens when you get these platforms. Are you going to still be able to be voiced to those who need someone to speak on their behalf? Are you going to be able to still raise the same kinds of issues and tell the same kinds of stories? One of my favorite pair of writers are Damon Young and Panama Jackson, who started a blog called Very Smart Brothers back in 2007. And these are some of the few men I write about in the book because they're just some of my favorite men. Um, <laughs> and they've had immense success with this blog and also separately from the blog in writing their own books and developing other things for the internet and writing in major newspapers and major magazines and things like that. But the community that they created in that blog, now everyone has access to. And the kind of enclave discourse that provided a sense of protection of some of the topics that were covered there isn't exactly the same anymore for good and bad. It's great that everyone has access to some of these topics. People need to be reading these men's work. They are fantastic, brilliant writers. But that also brings in the trolls and it brings in the people who live to make discussions like this go away. I don't think any of these folks were unprepared for this consequence of their action because the same thing happens at work and the same thing happens in your neighborhood when you move, right? And so there is always this knowledge of what happens when you take something that is a private community discussion and make it public. When you open those doors, you're making a decision of sorts, even if some of your goal may be to familiarize people with what you have going on. I personally am always a believer in that. If I become something familiar to you and not strange, I think that builds bridges, but it also means you're opening yourself up to whoever wants to walk in the door. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think a lot of the Black women that I write about on Twitter have found that to be the case, that the familiarity that was an integral part of building a following, of getting people to listen, has now turned into demands from people who think they know you. And you should write about this topic I tell you to write about, and I should have some say-so over your life. And we see a lot of that response happening now with Black women who will casual tweet about, what they're doing. you shouldn't do that. You should be writing about, why aren't you doing more of this? That's actually not appropriate. You really don't know these people. And so that familiarity coupled with the misogynoir, to use Moya Bailey's phrase. Wait, what's that term again? Misogynoir. And so Moya Bailey gives us this word, which is a really brilliant word to talk about misogyny as specifically directed toward Black women. That There's a very specific form of misogyny that Black women experience. And misogynoir coupled with this personal, relatable quality that was necessary in a lot of the brand leads to this demand that your body is one that I see as laborer, right? You are here to do a service for me, write for me, dance for me, do whatever it is that I need you to do in this moment. And I think we've seen that play out online. We've seen that play out during election cycles. There's countless spaces where we ask Black women to do the labor of fixing, of making things better, of alleviating the stress of the environment or of rectifying some wrong that they didn't create. 
as I was reading your book, I was watching this happen in real time. So a while back, we talked to some medievalists who are really active on Twitter. One of the leading scholars in the field is a black woman, and all the medievalists say there's no Atlantis, and all the trolls pile on the black woman for it. Right. Saying the same thing. There are certain people, certain humans, certain images that we're more comfortable with as our villain. And there are folks that we're more comfortable with as our heroes. And there are folks that we see as victims and folks that we see as they had it coming. And these are really long-term systems that are really hard to undo when we're not willing to acknowledge that they exist. That's where I felt like where you sort of revealed spaces where these things are not existing in this way or not as toxic, where there's different kinds of ways of knowing or different kinds of discourse or more mutuality or prioritizing self-care, things like that. Right. And some of these things have worked their way into the mainstream and in productive ways. And some of them have worked their way into the mainstream in ways that are less productive. The version of self-care that I talk about in the book comes to us from Audre Lorde, who's talking about the preservation of the self as a Black woman as an act of political revolution. Audre Lorde wasn't talking about bath bombs and, you know, <laughs> scented candles uh, and whether we made it to yoga this week. But of course, that's what we were thinking. And that's actually really a brilliant rhetorical strategy used by folks to undermine revolutionary thought. We do this with so many terms, right? And so another thing that's come out of Black feminist studies that this has happened with is the term intersectionality, unfortunately, which is a really powerful and important concept that has come to mean a lot of things that are not what the person who coined that term meant, Kimberly Crenshaw, nor the countless other Black women who have been writing about this notion of intersectionality in different ways for a lot of years. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you so much for joining us today. There is a definite thread in your book of a promise for better digital spaces and better digital community and behaviors. I'd like to know how the optimism part of your job title ties in with your work and your research. I think when we were starting this disco network, <laughs> the shorter name for it, with O being the optimism, when we were trying to figure out what to call ourselves, the group of researchers that I work with landed on this term optimism to describe the way that each of us really think about and approach our work in the digital realm. And it was really important to us to name ourselves that way in order to make sure it was clear that, yes, while we study topics like race and gender, that doesn't mean that we study deficient and deviance and sadness and violence and hatred all of the time. In fact, many of us don't study ideas of violence and hatred at all. <laughs> when I am looking at spaces created for and by Black women, they are optimistic and happy and exuberant and exalted spaces where people are uplifted and cared for and thought about as full, whole human beings online. And so often when people ask, how are you online all the time? Isn't it just so sad and depressing, <laughs> um, which is a thing. And I will say it's gotten a little bit more in that camp in the last year for me in spaces like Twitter. But I very carefully cultivate my online world. And it is a funny, 
sometimes silly place that brings a lot of joy into my life. And if it weren't, I don't know that I'd spend much time there for personal reasons or for study. <laughs> it would very quickly get old and I'd have to move on. A lot of what I do in the book is think about the spaces that people craft for themselves to sustain themselves, to give themselves that kind of joy and that kind of pleasure. And that kind of what Andre Brock talks about is the libidinal spaces online that are not there necessarily for financial reasons or social capital or economic gain, they are there because they feel good and that we like to do stuff sometimes because it feels good to do. And recognizing that that is true about Black women too is a step toward acknowledging that Black women are full, agentic human beings like everyone else. That everything we do is not about race and diminishment and hatred and violence. Sometimes we make the joke because it's funny. You know, we post the picture because we look good that day. And that's as simple as it can be. And that simplicity is, I think, really key. So a lot of the work that these digital Black feminists are doing online, they're doing in the context of a space that they've carefully cultivated and crafted to be a wonderful space. And it's a lot of work to cultivate those kinds of spaces online, but they've done it. And I think we should pay attention to how people go about doing that and go about doing it knowing that all of the violence and the hatred still exist and that they're going to have to combat it and that eventually it'll find its way in. So I'm going to say three things. So one is, I think you're talking about something so key, which is this idea that you can cultivate a space for yourself. And I think that can go way beyond just what you're talking about in terms of black feminism. There's lessons there for any marginalized or oppressed or disenfranchised community. And I learned the lessons from these groups. So this isn't my advice to anyone by any means. This is my observation, being a part of the group, but also witnessing, as you said, countless marginalized communities doing this over the course of history, right? And now having to redo it in these digital spaces as well. For my edification and for some of the listeners, libidinal. Yeah. I mean, we're not talking oh, about I'm gonna sexy do my here. Best. I, mean... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a little bit, a little bit, right? So I'll try my best, but we'll also point your listeners towards what I think is a wonderful book, which is called Distributed Blackness by Andre Brock, where he explains this so much better than I'm going to right now. But he writes about the libidinal economy of Black digital spaces. And he writes about this in order to say, so often we talk about what people are doing generally, especially in the academy, where we talk about like a neoliberal capitalist system where we're all working and we're laborers and everything we do in every context is about supporting the system. And Brock is asking us to think about the irreverent, non-productive inefficiencies of our lives as well, and specifically of Black life, which often gets thought of as being in the service of dismantling racism and activism and we're gathering to do these things. He's like, yeah, 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 we do that. But also we make funny memes for our cousin. Also, we do ratchet things after hours that nobody gets to see. We do that too because we're whole human beings. And so Brock talks about this as intentionally libidinal spaces, right? Where it's just about pleasure and joy and what feels good to people. And I'm really getting on this train, I have to say, after reading his work and talking to him about it, and how much space it opens up for us to really think about the full humanity of the people that we encounter every day, that they don't exist for us. They're not there to do work and labor for us. And this, as you point out rightly, applies to a plethora of humans that we think about as in service of our needs and in service of our desires, that off that they have desire. But I'm really interested in the boring parts of the internet. Um, of the places that don't get covered by the New York Times as being really important to the Black Lives Matter movement, where people are just talking about their hair care routine. Because I think there's really important work happening there too. And fun and joy. The other thing I wanted to ask, and this comes back to specifically what has been the focus of your work, which is Black women cultivating these spaces. You talked about how they need to carve out these spaces online. I get the concept, but in a practical sense, is this a private group on Facebook? Is this a private Instagram? This is a good question because I think it changes so much. At the start of the book, I'm writing about these blogs, which you know we think about as walking these really interesting line between public and private. None of these blogs that I studied private. They weren't locked down. You didn't need a password, but you did need some inside information to participate. So you're starting in the middle of a conversation, basically, which kind of invites certain people in and dissuades other people from participating. And that was sufficient at a certain stage of our digital lives <laughs> in this country. It's not sufficient anymore as a, a way of keeping folks out who don't need to be a part of it, I would say. And so we've seen some of these enclave spaces 
move off of social media platforms like Facebook or Twitter as our society becomes more aware of who has access to our data and how it gets sold and used. And I think that Black women who have been in these spaces for a long time have a really good sense of how these things can be used against them. And so a lot of these conversations, if I'm being frank now, are much harder to research. It's much harder to look at private group chats, which is where a lot of folks went post-2016. People going into spaces that aren't going to be scraped by researchers or corporate interests for advertising reasons and for political reasons, going to places where their data can't be taken from them anymore. And so we as researchers have some decisions to make about how we're going to think about documenting or if we're going to think about documenting spaces like that, where people are intentionally saying to us, we don't want to be documented. We want you to leave us alone. That's why we left. <laughs> Is that like a private signal thread and it's sort of invitation only? Absolutely. I think a lot of these spaces started in public arenas. So Sarah Florini writes a book called Beyond Hashtags, where she talks about Black podcasts and talks about how a lot of these Black podcasters started out on Twitter or Facebook and had these community followings of very public places. And then fewer people were regularly responding and they moved to a different platform and some of those people went with. And they moved to another platform and some people went with. As that happened, you have this chain of folks who become enmeshed in one another's lives and not just the topic at hand. So it might have originally been about Game of Thrones or it might have been about some other popular culture moment. Now it's about us, this community of people who know each other and get each other's jokes and are safe here. And as she points out, which you all know probably very well, is that podcasts are an interesting enclave because it's a little bit harder to troll in a podcast. You got to be really dedicated to troll a podcast, right? Like who's going to listen to all of this talk? What she explains in that book is how people move between platforms really expertly to make best use of the platform for the reasons they have, for what the platform has to offer until moving to the other one where it can make the best use and they can do things there. And again, this is not so far off if we study our history of how marginalized communities have moved in the world outside of digital culture, right? I was actually just thinking about that, and this is sort of a personal thing. I grew up in New York in the 70s and 80s, and so roving DJ parties right, were, right. you followed the DJ or the band, but you had to know. You had to know. You had to be sort of plugged in to the group because it was never going to be in the same place at the same time. It was not really going to be advertised. I love that. That's such a great metaphor for how this works. I mean, we see this even in Twitter spaces now where folks were using hashtags before to signal that they're talking about certain shows or topics or ideas. And this kind of quiet decision to not use the hashtag anymore and that you have to just have already been following me. We're leaving this one behind, right? I love it. I love to see someone just pick up a conversation. So are we talking about this today? And people go, yes, let's talk about this. And people are like, what's this? What's this? Not for you if you don't know. Move on. <laughs> I want to talk about this just a little bit more because you talk about so many different levels and approaches to digital black feminist discourse online. And you pointed out how hashtags can be the signs and the signifiers you were talking about how you can say one thing and it means something totally else and only the people that you're talking to will understand what you're saying. And there are so many levels and varieties. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Most of this is me thinking of ways that Black discursive practices historically have just migrated into these digital spaces. So signifying practices, which are talking around a topic and talking about it without talking about that thing out loud, but the person knows what you're talking about, playing the dozens, which is this kind of back and forth banter that happens in Black communities of kind of one-upping each other that is a game that is playful, but to an outside eye might seem vicious or harsh. These kinds of practices of parody, of fable, of storytelling have these really long histories in Black spaces. And the reason that they do is because the voice is one thing that couldn't be removed. So much of cultural legacy and even the body was taken viciously 
but the voice couldn't be completely taken away. And in fact, the voice is the site of immense creativity where people are able to merge the traditions of West African storytelling with Elizabethan English, right? And are, are able to make this thing merge together in ways where they can do the work of promoting freedom, right? Of talking about running away, of making fun of the person who's in charge of them, making fun of their superior, or in the case of enslaved folks, making fun of people who are enslavers without them knowing. And there's a power to that that's really inside the person. And we see this happen online in really funny and clever ways. In years past, using certain hashtags where an entire community of people will rally around a hashtag for a day making jokes. I think I used the example of Paula's best dishes in the book, which is always a fan favorite. This is Paula Dean who got into a world of trouble around racism supposedly happening in her restaurant. And rather than there being this piling on of people being like, I'll never eat Paula Dean's food, she's the worst. Black folks on Twitter did what we do on Twitter, which is we talked about her, but in a funny way. So we made Paula's best dishes, which is just making up racist names of recipes and circulating them with the hashtag. And would you know this was happening if you weren't a part of this community? Probably not. If you happened upon one of the tweets, you would be appalled by the use of, <laughs> you know, what are folks talking about here? But if you have the high context to know, one, Paula Dean is in this world of trouble. Two, Paula Dean is a a white chef from the South who has made an entire career of utilizing recipes from Black Southern kitchens to get famous, right? And get very rich from, right? And now all of this racism is catching up. So Paula, these are your best dishes, right? It's the things that you serve. And that is the way that in the midst of not being able to do anything about Paula Dean, let's be real, like practically, Black folks had no power to shift what was going to happen with Paula Dean. But that discourse online won made sure everyone knew we weren't okay with it. Two, also was a pushback against a world in which a figure like that can profit from Black folks whilst causing Black folks harm. And it almost comes all the way back to that notion of optimism, which is Absolutely. sometimes humor can be better medicine than anger and bitterness. Oh, yeah. I mean, the way that hope is packaged, I think, historically through activist movements is really important. It's not packaged as these are the worst of times. I don't know how we're going to get out of this. It's through our song. It's through our joy. It's through optimism and that we're on the path to that. And we're going to enjoy the bounty that we have in the present. I think that's a super positive, poetic and optimistic note to end this segment on. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you so much for talking with us about your work and your new book. I was wondering whether you could talk with us a little bit about what some of your takeaways are. How can we improve our technological arena by listening to Black women or learning from what they've learned? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think a lot of times academics spend a lot of time diagnosing problems and maybe less time talking solution base. We all are coming from different perspectives and have different access to different kinds of power systems and different kinds of privileges and different kinds of spaces. So I think recognizing the places where we have power is really impactful and important. One thing I talk about in the book as a measure for myself in writing it is to recognize the differential power situation I have from the people I write about. And and therefore what I'm responsible for in telling their stories that they didn't ask me to tell. 
where does my responsibility lie in terms of the kind of research and writing that I do that centers Black women in ways that makes their life better and not worse, that contributes to their health and well-being and not further harm. That's one space where I, as a Black woman, have to think about how am I centering Black women in the work I'm doing in the spaces that we occupy? How can we begin to think about the tools that we use, the technologies that we have access to that are really helpful to us, that we really like, as not being created and designed for people who don't look like us? We who live in the U.S. thinking about how folks in the global South are getting access to tools and technologies that were not designed for those communities and what it means for us to have our lives improved by technologies that cause harm and how we can choose to participate and not continue to participate in making companies profitable who continue to decenter certain folks from their design practices. But the average person who wants to do better can start by removing themselves from the center of their thinking about how the world works and who it should work for. And it's why Black feminism, as Bell Hook says, is for everyone. Because for Black women to be free, it would mean that everyone else has achieved said freedom. So if we are going to do more than have t-shirts or caps or buttons that say, you know, listen to Black women, and we're actually going to do some of that listening, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to make ourselves, to avail ourselves of entirely different ways of seeing and existing in the world, of consuming not for profit or for our own gain, but for the purpose of expanding our mind, the writing and the thinking and the thought work of Black women, of citing them in the work we do. We're folks who can invite people to shows, thank you, invite Black women on to talk about their ideas as equal partners at a table and invite them before the problems come up. I think very often something that many of us do is once problems of racism emerge, we want to bring in the Black women to fix the problem. That's really not the best strategy, you know, <laughs> putting Black women who already functionally have less access to these spaces in a situation that's failing doesn't actually do much for that individual nor for your cause. But how about at the start of the program, the start of the nonprofit? That's where we ask people to join and be equal partners and ask them what they need to get out of this experience to make it valuable for them. In our neighborhoods and in our organizations and in our workplace, we can inhabit some of the practices of a more equitable society that actually prioritizes the thinking, the thought work, and the expertise of Black women, not simply their bodies in a space to be counted as part of a diversity, equity, inclusion program. The tech world can definitely benefit from that lesson. And what would that actually look like in the tech world and in the digital spaces? In a practical sense, we have a lot of undoing to do, which means that the forces in our society that are responsible for that, I'm a person who believes that societies are responsible to the citizens in ways, so without getting hyper-political, I think that we need people in congressional staff positions, in policy positions, who both understand the technologies that we're using, but also have the expertise to know how they can be refashioned and reimagined in ways. We are have a desperate need for people who make public policy to better understand how technology actually works and the impact that it has on ordinary citizens' lives. In companies, an investment in actually thinking about the design stage, how these kinds of products and moderations and comments and things like that would look in real spaces that don't look like the people who are currently in the design room. I think that those small moments are really important, right, of taking the time to explain things like algorithmic bias, who's responsible for these things that are built into the interfaces that we encounter, right? And it's really hard to think past what's on our screens. We're kind of socialized not to and to just look at the pretty buttons and what they can do for us. But it's really important that there are folks who are really committed to thinking about these issues and putting pressure on the rest of us to be more cognizant of how we use digital technology, how ubiquitous digital technology becomes in our lives to the point where not having a Facebook page or not having a Twitter account can have negative economic impacts on my life and my career and what that means. Negative personal effects too. You don't see your family's pictures anymore. Absolutely. There are these social consequences for sure, but there's definite economic consequences in terms of jobs and job security and looking for positions, right? I'm advertising a postdoc position almost exclusively on Twitter right now. Who's not going to see that? And that becoming how institutions set up practices going forward without thinking about the consequences. We also do have to acknowledge that a lot of these systems are intentional as well. They are intentional to keep certain groups with access to power and other groups on peripheries. And I think 
that we all have to be very aware of that as well, right? And there are folks who profit at major social media corporations from violence, from harassment, from mis and disinformation. And so if it's profitable, it's not accidentally so. There's so many stories that don't make the front page in big and small ways. And that's why I say, examine the places where you hold power. Are there places where you're a part of a search committee at your job or where you're a part of a neighborhood group? There are these small and large ways that we hold these kinds of power situations and where we replicate these same systems again and again of saying, I invite you into this space, but I do not welcome you to challenge that the space exists. I do not invite you to challenge me at the top of the space or that there is a hierarchy within the space. And that is really a place, I think, where we can all do some more work, myself included. You talk a lot about the gray areas, and you talk about complicated allegiances, and you talk about a, a dialectic of self and community interests. So it's living at this intersection and then balancing a lot of different kinds of stuff. I love the gray. So I borrow this term from Joan Morgan's hip hop feminism, that version of feminism living within this gray where it's not quite as clear cut as it seems to be. Hip hop feminism is founded on this idea that I can be a feminist who is deeply committed to equity and deeply committed to ending oppression of women. And I can really like hip hop. How do I sit with those two things when some of hip hop is deeply misogynistic? So how do I live in those two areas? How do I both celebrate this cultural thing that has power in terms of my ethnic and racial identity? How do I do both of those things? And I think digital black feminists are engaged in the same work. They're also making money from advertisers on their site. They're also doing influencer things where they're getting paid to wear a certain pair of shoes while they're at their charity event. How do we make sense of folks who are living in this gray space? Not only living within it, but advocating for the gray, saying that the messy, complicated space is actually not just okay, but it's where I prefer to be. And so they're having to advocate for what I call complicated allegiances, which is this idea that sometimes you got to work with folks whose personal politics aren't exactly your own, who have done things in the past that you don't like, who you're not quite certain about everything that they're going to do in the future. But in this moment, they can help with the harm reduction. My vote or my advocacy counts as this complicated allegiance where you and I can have a similar short-term goal, even if a lot of the other things surrounding it are not quite what we want. Black women historically historically have done this politically since we have gotten the right to vote. If you look at the way that Black women's voting patterns are, it's a constant realization that our allegiances are complicated and messy. Do you think some of this is generational? And kind of what I'm hearing you say about it being messy is it's okay to kick ass, take names, make your point, and I'm going to make a whole bunch of money. Oh, man, this is the messiest part. You would have me talk about the part that's going to get the hate mail. The reason it's where we are is not simply that folks are younger. I think it has something to do with our relationship with technology, with digital. We must live our lives online. That branding has become a requirement for our existence personal branding, that I must have an avatar and that my tweets must be consistent. For what? For why, right? But we are so deeply embedded in this, those of us who came of age with the internet, that it is just a part of who we are, right? Of course, that's how you behave online. Of course, I have to post all the pictures from this event this weekend so you'll understand my brand. This is what I wear. This is where I go. This is what I read. This is what I eat. And because we came up in this time to disentangle ourselves from the digital capitalist superstructure in order to do our feminist work is actually really challenging. What would that even look like? Would I just get offline and have no one hear what I say? Would I do all of my work for free? Well, no one was doing that. And we're not advocating that Black women be poor, right? And so I should make the money that I'm valued at within the system I live in, but does that contradict this idea that it's supposed to be community? So one of the principles that I assign or ascribe or find in digital Black feminism is this dialectic between self and community interests, this ability to simultaneously suggest that I care deeply about my community, that I am impassioned, that it is my vision to uplift and to bring and to climb with folks behind me and aside me, but also I will live and I will survive and I will be happy and I will be healthy and I won't sacrifice that in pursuit of racial justice that sometimes excludes me or feminist praxis that often excludes me. And it's messy and it's complicated, but I mean, isn't that the most fun part of life? <laughs> 
And so we just keep pushing toward this goal of training ourselves in understanding the lived experience of others, of understanding superstructures and systems so that we can do the work both internally, but also in places of power that we hold and have access to. And there's our action item for the end of the program. Dr. Steele, this has been an absolute pleasure. Same. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope you sell lots of books on your personal brand. Oh, me too. That would be nice. I got to get to work on my personal branding a bit more. And if you would like more information about Dr. Steele and her book, Digital Black Feminism, you can visit CatherineKnightSteele.com. That's Catherine with a C, Knight with a K-N, S-T-E-E-L-E. Dot com. Augment and Humanity is a program of the New Mexico Humanities Council produced in partnership with KUNM FM. You can visit us online and find out more about our programs at nmhumanities.org. Our theme music comes courtesy James Whiten, and we've had production assistance from Tristan Klum. <laughs>